Hello, I'm Alexa. You're listening to Adapted by Design. And today I'm speaking with my friend, Joey Banks, who I believe is the person to know in the design community when it comes to learning about design systems. Joey is a senior product designer at Webflow, working on design systems. And before that, he was at Twitter and Figma. Joey is also an expert educator when it comes to teaching Figma and helps his students with understanding how to use the software properly with the basics, but also with more advanced skills like prototyping and auto layout, which Joey uh, Joey just helped me with recently. We can talk more about that later. But before we get into all things about design systems, Joey, I would love for you to share more about your career getting into design. I believe you told me you started out in mechanical engineering, technically, right? Before quickly switching over to design. Yeah, thanks, Alexa. I'm so glad to be here. Thanks for asking about that. So yeah, let's see. I did start out in mechanical engineering. I Tony Stark was a superhero of mine growing up and, and someone I looked up to uh, in the comic book world. And I always wanted to build things. But it turns out I wasn't very good with my hands and I wasn't super excited about the the outlook. I'm based here in Ohio and a lot of, I don't know, a lot of other mechanical engineering students were heading off to places like Procter & Gamble or Lockheed Martin and neither of those sounded great at the time. And so as fun as it was and as much as I enjoyed the, the math and the physics and the science behind it all, uh, which still sticks with me, it just wasn't where I ended up. And I'm really, I'm grateful for that. I'm glad to have tried it and to, uh, to yeah, to have spent a few years there, but I'm so happy I found design. How did you actually, what, what clicked for you? Like, how, what was that first time you like really did hear about careers in design and, and make that connection? Yeah, it was it was interesting. I had a um, one of my best friends in college and, and actually one of my roommates, he was in the design program and he was more personally, he was more on the side of wanting to build and to create, you know, little plugins and widgets and basically to recreate all of the things that he and I were, were using daily just to see how far we could get. And he enjoyed design, but I think he he really he really fell in love with the, the coding side of it all. And he was looking for someone throughout the projects just to create little interfaces and I tried a few and I was pretty bad at it but I had so much fun Alexa just seeing like the blank canvas and coming up with an idea and you know really taking inspiration from other places as you know that and that's, that's kind of always been my thing where as a kid I was always growing up like looking at different pieces of I guess as a kid like different pieces of hardware right like appliances or the radio inside my parents car or climate controls like I always had to figure out how everything worked, uh, even if I wasn't using them. And I, I really enjoyed that. And so I think taking some of that inspiration of understanding how other tools or other little widgets in the industry worked and seeing how could we make that work for our use case was a pretty fun thing. And I realized too, I I definitely enjoyed like the part of like, okay, we've got a wireframe and now we get to make it look good. And that was always the, that was always the, the special part of the project. I definitely resonate with, with that as well. And I think once you do decide that you want to become a designer or or like once you start looking into careers in design, one of the first things is like seeing design. You start seeing it yeah. everywhere. It's like, oh my gosh, typography and signage. It's like yeah. someone chose that typeface to put on that <laughs> sign. Yes. And like all of everything is a design design decision. And like to your point with like all of the kind of like the products you were um, playing around with as like a, a younger person, it's like similarly, like someone had to build and put that together so that we could experience it as it is. I wish I knew enough about typography to be able to identify <laughs> different fonts that are used in the wild. But what I have started thinking about recently is the world of physical design. And it's not one that I, I have a lot of opportunities to, to play in or to even have a lot of insight into, but thinking around the decisions that we make as digital designers and thinking about the, the repercussions of them and all of the thought that has to go into it. It's really interesting, especially through the last couple of years, right? With everything supply chain related and how the world has, has just changed. Thinking of how little decisions add up and how there are so many pieces that have to go into like what we eventually hold in our hands are used. So maybe one day I'll have a chance to experiment more, more in that world. But it's just that whole concept of design is a really interesting one of seeing how your decisions play out and, and seeing how others are, of course, using them or interacting with them. Yes. Well, I will, for one, be the first to sit down and have that conversation with you because I... Yes, I please. Be so interesting. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Okay. okay so um, you, you discover design while you were still in that like mechanical engineering degree. What, what ended up happening? Like, how did you end up getting your first few roles in design? We had an amazing program at, uh, where I I went to school. It was at Miami University in, here in Ohio. And the program was during our fourth year, our senior year, we applied and a few of us were selected to spend a semester out in San Francisco. And it was a, such a scary thing, right? Like such an exciting thing, but to, you know, one, to have been chosen was unbelievable. And two, to have the opportunity to go out to California where I had never been before and to spend an entire semester out there and just like working was was unbelievable, especially during during the curriculum. And so the 
program was focused on, we had a few weeks, once we landed, we had a few weeks to find a job and to find like a, wow. a an internship essentially. Yeah. And we were challenged to do everything by ourselves, whether it was like, you know, cold outreaches, cold outreaches or networking or inviting others for coffee. Like it was all up to us to find these roles. And so those first couple of weeks, I was going from like 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. of just trying to meet people and trying to understand, you know, at the time back in 2014, uh, what it was like out there and what I could get into. And so it was it was really that program that was, you know, so scary, but so challenging and also just really rewarding that kick started like, oh, my gosh, I could, you know, start off uh, with the ability to kind of kick off the career in San Francisco as a designer working in the space where I've already gotten to know a number of people um, that are also in the space. It was it was the best thing I could have asked for. Um, such an unbelievable experience that I mean, it does. It sounds so unique. What a, I guess that's a testament to to community and like yeah. the program, like the, the program you were in kind of being able to facilitate this for you and that your the students you traveled with yeah absolutely yeah. there there were so many people who I had first met in 2014 or 2015 who I was just I was you know star-eyed to meet the, Do you those have an example? Design, uh well I first got to know Bryn Jackson and Brian Lovin out there uh who were you oh, know at the time they nice. were kicking off design details yeah Linda Eliason at Dropbox. She was uh, was always looking up to her, and she invited me for uh, for a quick coffee over there. And like th- those meetings, you know, just those thirty minute spots meant so much to me as someone who was just like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm standing inside Dropbox or Ardio or even Twitter. Mm-hmm. It was just incredible. And so that's something that I've learned of like how much, gosh, I don't know, just how much that affected my career and how much those interactions really meant to me. And it's been amazing to try to stay in touch with those people. Absolutely. And did you land a job? Yeah. Yeah. I did. So I first landed at a place that it wasn't quite the right fit. I was working 12 to 13 hours and it was a lot. And I I realized like, you know, this is, this probably le- would lead to something amazing, but it's not leaving me with a lot of time to, you know, explore the rest of San Francisco in the way and, as it relates to like the career, right? And, and other and opportunities. What kind, of, what kind of job was it back then? Like what was your title? I was an intern designer. Um, it was paid and I was working mostly on like email campaigns and some marketing assets. And okay. I quickly realized that Alexa, I am not someone who is good at marketing <laughs> or coming up with illustrations or anything outside yeah. of the, the typical rectangles. So it was a, it was a really fun experience and eye opening. But I ultimately chose to join a company where my friends and I were using this to get around to our different meetings. And this was before there were scooters on every block. The company was called Scoot, and there were these they were these red like electric Vespas almost, oh, and you okay. could rent these with your phone for a really low cost per hour. And we were using them all hours of the day just to get around to get groceries just to explore San Francisco like riding up to Sutro Tower and one of those was the highlight I think <laughs> they didn't have much power so you were going up that hill at like five miles an hour but it was oh, fun those um, San Francisco <laughs> hills can get very yeah. steep yeah yeah <laughs> absolutely so it was a little scary but that that company you know had just meant so much to our experience and to how we were seeing the rest of the city and so I noticed their their app it, it looked like it looked like it was still very much up and coming in the in like the best sense of the word. It was super functional, but the design was not yet very styled, if that makes sense. And so I put together a quick unsolicited redesign just with some ideas that I felt would have been useful to me as a new writer, uh, really in regards to like the onboarding experience and education experience. And uh, I was so thankful that they reached back out and wanted to bring me in for an interview. And so that's where I that's where I first joined. So cool. Yeah, I mean, really, you know, uh, intimidating, right? Like as someone who had never really practiced design and sending this company like a a design that they didn't ask for felt all sorts of wrong and quite intimidating. But I, I was really glad to have had the the um, you know the encouragement from others to do that. Uh, it worked out. So I spent about a year there. I was the only designer, but it was the job that you know I'm thankful for because it got me into the industry. It taught me a lot about what does it mean to be the only designer at a company, especially when you're brand new to design and how you know challenging that can be in all sorts of ways. But also how cool it can be. You got to see all parts, and you got to. Uh, I was a part of so many conversations with engineers and product that I never imagined were. So yeah. it was a pretty fun time. Yeah. Wow. That's so interesting to hear you say that, Joey, because I ended up doing one of my first UX or like product design internships, I think the summer of 2013. And I was hired by a designer and Mm -hmm. uh, I was like going to be working under her for the summer at this startup, like a travel startup. And she ended up having to leave the company for like medical reasons. And I ended up being the only designer at that startup. And I feel like I had very similar experience to you where I like wasn't I, I learned a lot. I was working with engineering and product mm-hmm. in ways I was really not expecting. And, and I grew a lot from that. And so I think 
think it's just like, yeah, there's so much to experience, no matter if you can find yourself a company where you have like a mentor or someone you can like really look up to in design yeah. or otherwise. Like I, I was really grateful for that experience, even though it wasn't, didn't end up being exactly what I was looking for. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think a lot of people go through that. And the, the way that I felt like I wasn't, you know, I, I was so quick to say, I don't know if I belong here. I, I feel like such a foster, even though I know this is my first job and I'm just getting into the field, but wow, I don't know if I'm good at this, or I don't know if I have the stamina or ability to like survive in this, this industry, but meeting others and just kind of connecting in that way and sharing the similar experiences of what we were going through was so helpful. And even today, right? Like now that we're a few years older and with a little bit more experience, like we probably, I know I do, I, I share many of those same feelings that I had back then of, Hey, I don't know if I'm good at this. I don't know if I can do this. I feel like an imposter. Like those feelings still persist. And yeah. so meeting with people and, and sharing about that and just knowing that we're all going through some form of that in one way or another continues to be the most helpful thing. Yeah. That feeling never goes away as you continue nope. to learn and grow. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Not at all. And maybe it's not such a bad thing, right? Like at least for me, I know it's, it's kept me just curious to learn more and, and, and to not necessarily like settle when I do feel comfortable. And I, I know that's such a privilege to be able to like continue to grow in that way. But, but that feeling of you know, I'm seeing so many talented people around me who are doing amazing things. And I just want to try to keep up, even if it's 20 steps behind them is, is a, a feeling that's hard, but also really rewarding. We, I want to talk about design systems because like I said, yeah. you're the person I think to talk to about design systems before we get too far into the conversation. Could you just define like, what is a design system? Great question. <laughs> <laughs> there are so many definitions to this. And I was thinking a lot about how would I define one? And uh, we had an example at work last week where I think in a Slack, someone or myself just said, you know, design system is so much about communication. And that really resonated where it's like you are communicating so many things with your team and with other people as it relates to using components, using patterns, trying to build the best thing, right? And that comes in all shapes and forms, whether it's documentation or a Figma component library or meetings or even just written guidelines. But I think it's I think it's about communication. It's like a practice to show how things are used and how to best use them, you know, for the experience of, of other designers and the customers on, you know, who are using the product. So I don't know, maybe like short a, and sweet. Yeah. It's kind of like a language, right? Like communication. I think so. Language. Yeah. yeah. And it's, and there's so much to it, right? Like when I was first starting out in design systems and th this was back at a healthcare company, I, so when I was at Scoot, I, I unfortunately was diagnosed with type one diabetes, which led to me wanting to get into healthcare. And within the healthcare space, we realized if we had some sort of library that let us not have to build this button again and again and again, this would help us out and would therefore help our patients out. And that was my first foray or entrance into design systems. And it was exactly that that got me excited about it. And they come in all shapes and sizes. For us at that company, it was a very small Figma file, just when Figma was beginning to experiment with components. Before, you know, styles were ever a thing. We were, we were creating components out of text, but we never did any sort of documentation at the time. It was just in Figma. Whereas you take a design system now and there's so much to it. You know, the engineering side, the design side, the product side, the consumer side. And so I think it really does come in all shapes and sizes, but the intent was the same. It was to help the team out and to help the end consumer of the product out. And that's the part that's always been really motivating to me. It's like they can be malleable. They can be dynamic. There's not like a one size approach fits all. And mm -hmm. that part is especially exciting. So I guess for someone who's completely new to design, trying to understand like what a design system is and what it might look like. You know, you talked about components. Could you break down just an example, like maybe a button, like what would a button look yeah. like in a design system and, and what would the lately, you know, the language or the, how would we communicate about it? Yeah, that's a great question. And I love the example of the button because no matter the design system you're working on, you have some sort of, some sort of button. Well, there's a lot. If you take a, if you take a button, it might not look complex on the outside, but you start thinking about styling and how this button appears. Then you start thinking about, let's say themes such as light mode or dark mode. And so you have to support two different types of buttons or aesthetics of buttons. And then you think about all of the states that it can have, right? If you're on mobile, you have touch or a press state. If you're on desktop, you have a hover or a focus state. You think about the whether or not there could be an icon inside or a label, a position of that icon, the two buttons next to each other, right? Like there's so many things that you take this one little button and you're like, yeah, it's a button. How complex could it be? And then you just realize that it's not hard to get to 32 or 64 different states of this button, depending on the design system that you're working on. And so for in, in Figma, how I try to think about things like this are bringing it as close as I can to engineering as possible. And so what that usually means is creating all of the states and therefore all of the variants and even the component property names to best align to how an engineer would see that button. When I was
was first starting in Figma, when I was creating these, you know, more complex buttons using things like variants and component properties, I was doing things like setting a property called type. And, you know, in that type, you might have values such as like, oh, this is a hovered button or a focus button or a disabled button, whatever it might be, or whatever, whatever you might call it at the individual company. And what I quickly did, or what I quickly realized through the help of engineering was actually creating different variant names to support everything that that button do. That way, if you're a designer and you pull the button in, you can look at the right panel and right away in Figma know all of the different states that that button can have. And that was like a, that was an unlock moment for me of how to build components, but also how to keep them really in line with what production or engineering was seeing. And that part has been especially fun as I try to, as I try to maintain these buttons. So you were, I mean, I think you just spoke about this a little bit, but like, why is it important that this is all documented? You know, it, it like it, especially it makes sense on the engineering side, but like also why, yeah. why is it important on the, the design side, like for yeah. the, the design team to use? I think it's, you know, it's a, it's a good question with a few reasons. The first one is I, what my, the motivation for me behind design systems has been both wanting to create better and more consistent products or to help the team create better and more consistent products. But the, the second thing is like the, the users who we're creating for are the people who quote sit next to us, the, the other designers in the room who are building amazing things for the end customer. And and the goal of mine is to always make their experience the best that it can be so that they're like, you know, uh, there's no reason for them to have a hard day at work because they're struggling with the design system that they're they're needing to use, right? And so as a part of that, clear guidelines and usage patterns and examples and more templates to kick off with make the lives, I think, of, of others easier on the team so that they can build more quickly and so that they can feel more confident with, with what they're creating, knowing that it matches other patterns or other areas that are functioning well, right? That we can continue to pass on than the product. And so, or that part has always been very motivating of just working for the people next to you and then getting to see right away, like how it's working for them. And so to your point around why, why do these guidelines need to exist? Well, I think they're important because they, they quickly translate that knowledge to others, whether you're new to the company or you're shifting teams, or maybe it's just been a, a bit since you visited that area, that ability to pick something up right away and know where that piece sits and how it sits and perhaps even why it, it sits. And then you take all of those and you even might combine it with a little bit of education, right? Like how did this piece come to be? Why did we, why, why was it important for us to support this component? And how can you best support this component through good accessibility practices or even using what we've built is all very exciting. And it's probably the biggest challenge. Like the easiest thing is building it in Figma, I think sometimes. And the hardest thing is making sure that others can use it in a really clear and responsible way. And I think to your point too, it's like when all of those decisions are already made and it's designed and I can pull that button component in, let's say, it allows me as a designer who's consuming the design system to think about the other very important design decisions that relate to the you know the project and the problem I'm trying to solve as it yeah. relates to the, the the product that I'm designing for. Definitely. You know, I think so many of us speaking personally, <laughs> I'm always very nervous going into a design review, right? Because I'm I'm trying to prepare like the best work and I, I want to make sure that my, you know, all of my I's are dotted, my T's are crossed, and I want to make sure everything looks correct. And I think that confidence that you can instill through the design system of you are working with the most up-to-date pieces and like what you're presenting on the screen is going to be like the focus will not be on the UI itself or the elements themselves but more so on like the the experience of what you're sharing like that part has always been especially important and if we can make one one half of that conversation or one half of that you know fear going into a design review or putting something out there for others to use a little easier that's a pretty cool responsibility and that is that is definitely motivating. So at a minimum what do you think a design system needs to have? Well buttons as we've discovered uh <laughs> Yes. <laughs> you know, there's there's a couple pieces. When, as I mentioned, like when I was first starting in design systems, I thought a design system was just a Figma file with a bunch of components. And I very quickly learned that, that is like one tenth of a design system you know, actually having the file that supports that, whether it's in Figma or Sketch or other amazing tools. The other pieces are documentation and really communication because like a design system is nothing if it's not being used and it's it falls flat really quickly if it's not being evolved. I think the biggest challenge is trying to keep the system either one step ahead or even or as close to one step ahead as you can, right? Usually we're a few steps behind, but the goal is always like one step ahead or right there. And if you're missing the pieces that allow for you and your team to understand what 
is coming down the, the design pipeline and what is coming down the product pipeline and how is our product shaping and changing to fit our current user base, those pieces are really important. So at a minimum, communication, things within Figma, things well documented in code, a team that is able to support and identify where we can help and where we can make changes. And I think just the room for the ability to to allow others to to try to, you know, find support when needed, right? And to also contribute back to the system as they continue to like push their design forward. There's probably a lot more there, but as I think about the core pieces of my workday and, and the things that I try to set up, it's usually around just making sure that others who are relying on the system are supported and feel like they've got row their own work in the right way. The, the last thing I'll say real quick is like, you never want to create a system that is too constrained where others can't grow within it or push it. And something I've always believed is like, it's it's totally fine. You know, I know there's the meme out there to never detach components, but you have to. Otherwise, it's it's the, the component can't necessarily come before the design in all cases. There are base components and structural components that are there that are necessary. But I think it's really important to allow others to find the room to explore and to try new patterns, to, to use existing patterns, and then to create paths for all of those new trial and errors to make their way back into the system where it feels right. Oh, that's a relief. You heard it here. <laughs> yes, that. detach. Detach components. It's okay. It, you, sometimes yes. you need to. <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Do you have an example where you've had one of the designers on your team come to you and say like, you know, hey, like how, I guess just like, how does it work at Webflow when it comes to developing out the system? You'll have your projects, I imagine are scoped probably like every quarter that are like really important, big, bigger kind of projects that the team needs. But then maybe a designer comes and says like, hey, there's this very specific thing I'm looking for. Like, what is that yeah. dynamic? like, I guess, when it comes to like working together? Yeah, it's an important thing that we set up and it's still a work in progress. So everything I share is not perfect or complete, but it's the idea is there and the team is there to support it. We kicked off a new meeting a few a few weeks ago or a few months ago now, which is essentially a meeting every or once a week. And during this time, it's, it's available time for engineers and designers on design systems to come together and to meet with anyone who needs support. And what we're really trying to look for here is getting an earlier partnership for as the design phase kicks off. And so what I mean by this is like if a new design project is starting, we want to have the space to work with the designer as they think of what patterns to use or what modifications to existing components might be needed, right? And so instead of a designer coming to us at the very end and kind of checking their design against the design system, I think what's really important and what we're trying to form is the ability to work and to partner with a designer through their work and not necessarily telling them how to design. That's definitely not our job, but our job is to, as a good friend puts it, our job is to try to identify like where someone is nailing a screw in the wall and just swap that out for them and say, hey, it's I saw your I saw your nailing the screw in the wall. I wanted to let you know that we have this thing called a nail. And if you'd like, it's here for you to use and here's how to use it. Right. Yeah. And so not being prescriptive in that way, but being supportive in that way is really important. And so that meeting, you know, it doesn't solve every problem, but it's at least another avenue for where communication can happen. And that way we are more in line with the work that's that's coming and we can better support that designer and accessibility concerns and everything that's related to creating a component that works for a design is important to us. That sounds like a really productive use of everyone's time. It's fun. Yeah. It's, and it's, it's anything. Fun. It's a, yes. yeah, it's a way to come together and talk components and to even share our roadmap, right? Because the one tough thing on design systems in my experience is like you kind of, you go away for a little bit and you work on all these things. And then you know that there's like a time coming for when you get to share everything. And like when you're, when your new doc site is ready or when your brand new component library is available to use and the, this meeting provides just a slight avenue for anyone to like take a peek at the work that's happening and what they can look forward to. And, you know, for us to share more of our process, right? We we definitely don't want to work in a silo. And that's at least what I believe. Never trying to be like prescriptive from the top down, but also wanting to share, hey, this is what we're working on, how we're doing it. Also, if you're interested, like perhaps we can allow you to contribute components that you've either created locally, or if you have an interest to partner with us on this component as we carry it forward. That, that moment is really special, I think. And anything that allows for more of those moments feels like a, a big win. So maybe you've already shared this when it, when it came to that like health tech company that you worked with. Mm -hmm. But what would you say was the first design system you created? What was it that moment yeah. or anything before that? It was that moment for sure. Okay. It was a small system. There were let's see, we were, we were working on a physician platform and a patient platform. Gosh, there were so many fun components that we built at the time. And th this is before like auto layout. This is before styles. Oh my gosh, where, before where auto could, like, layout. I know what? it's amazing how we designed anything. <laughs> Um, yes. But it was it was a simple time because like there were you, there were some really complex tools in Figma, but when we it was actually more challenging in some ways because you had to think of well how do I build this component to be user scalable and dynamic based on what anyone might 
might insert into this component or how they might use it uh, with limited tooling. But as a part of that design system, there were all sorts of things. There were, it was a focus on chat. It was a focus on like dashboard UI, which I, I loved at the time and still do of just how do you present like the most and the right information at the right time uh, for anyone who is viewing. But it was, it was really, it was also a great experience because our demographic was different than one I was used to working. At the scooter company, it was very focused on like younger people in San Francisco. And at this health tech company, it was very much focused on patients all over the spectrum with all sorts of uh, abilities or inabilities based on where they were at. And so designing different themes and designing with really good accessibility in mind, you know, for the time for, for how much I knew was was important. And uh, that little design system is, is still... Um, still very close to my heart. I, I really enjoyed working on that. You brought up accessibility a couple times. And again, the, I know a lot of people listening are, are new to design. So and, and de- accessibility and design systems kind of go hand in hand. Could you just describe for someone who's completely new, like what exactly is accessibility and how is it baked into a design system? I think accessibility, there's all sorts of definitions and people who are much more specialized in this can give a better one. But for me, it's, it's thinking of all people and ensuring that anyone can use something you're making. And the reason I like things thinking about it within the world of design systems is because, again, I don't know everything, but it's it's a chance to learn something about how to create something that is usable for everyone. And the reason I think it's important in design systems is because components start somewhere. The UI starts somewhere. And when you think of accessibility des- starting with design systems, it forces accessibility to be thought of at the very beginning rather than the very end or even after the end, after something is shipped. And so um, I've been on teams where we've had a dedicated accessibility designer and I want to give a shout out to, to Lauren Race, who I worked with really closely at Twitter, who is an amazing accessibility designer. And she was someone on her team. It was my very first time working with uh, an individual whose whole responsibility was design systems accessibility. And she was someone who we could go to for any questions and who was also there helping us design the component in a really thoughtful and scalable way for everyone to use. So yeah, I, a lot there, but I, I it's just, it's, it's like a whole nother world within design of understanding how to design for everyone and how to make something look both good, but also functional. And that that's a really exciting piece. Yeah, we'll have to bring someone on the podcast at some point to talk specifically about accessibility, because to your point, it's a whole other career path that someone could take. Yeah, and learning absolutely. About all those best pa- practices. I think one maybe easier or simpler example to think about for someone starting out is when it comes to color accessibility. Mm-hmm. There's actually a lot of really great tools. Maybe we'll be able to include in the show notes for being able to test your color yeah. accessibility. So like for some something like a button, right? You can kind yep, of go back yes, to that. Yes. Making sure that your button typography and the color background, that the contrast is uh, deep enough or contrasted yeah. enough so that people with different levels of uh, reading ability can can see yeah, it, right? Absolutely. There's... Um... And, and that, that's an entire world in itself. And where I got really excited was, okay, I feel like, you know, I have a deep, I have a decent understanding of what it means to create something that is, has a high enough contrast for, for it to work for most people. But then you start thinking about the experience for someone on iOS or Android or, or the web and thinking of things like tab order and keyboard focus and all of the different, like, you know, even understanding what it means for someone who is vision impaired to rely on both keyboard navigation and screen readers. It's just an totally different experience that's also designed and so yeah if anything like you don't even have to know or or to to do the work yourself but just being aware of how it is coming together and how like the team and other teams out there are taking steps to to inspire the rest of the industry i think is really awesome i've noticed there have been more ui kits published to figma that are focused on accessibility ebay one company in particular just released an annotation kit to help with tab order and focus stage which was an amazing push and we did something very similar at twitter which uh, with Lauren again, which was a very fun thing because you get to represent the company, you get to represent the work, and hopefully by sharing like, hey, we are doing this at this company, you can at your company as well. Like that is the motivation there, and, and providing any sort of resource for others to use always feels like a win. So it's exciting to see when like companies are allocating more and more time for everyone to be able to use their product rather than just a you know a select majority. Would you say you have a favorite design system? Oh, that's a good question. I can't say my own because I'm always I'm always (laughs) feeling imposter syndrome of the stuff I work on. I gotta, I gotta just throw this in there because I, uh, I play a lot of basketball. Like that's my sport. I've been playing since I was like very young, Uh, but I don't watch a lot of basketball. So people are always like, Alex, what's your favorite basketball team? And I'm like, I think my own, my, my team, the one that I'm playing on is my favorite. Yeah. (laughs) So I don't know if you feel similarly with yours, but... (laughs) 
<laughs> I think I, I don't know if this is, <laughs> this is analogous to sports, but I feel like I look at different design systems for different pieces that are really exciting. I was recently looking at Gusto's design system, which mm-hmm. they have, they have an amazing site and a wonderful like component status page, which I thought was really inspiring. Pinterest also Gestalt has a, a great design system that's, that's out there in public and, you know, IBM Carbon as well. And, you know, the challenge here, right, is there are so many design systems, but public design systems, there's, there's a very small number of them. And so the insight that we get to see into different companies is, is usually not that large. And so we all t- tend to gravitate to these these ones that are more public and vocal. And I think that's why, like, knowing that this is a small subset, but I trying to identify, like, oh, my gosh, that's really interesting how they publish a newsletter with their design system or how they include a status page. Or I really like how they treat, like, the, uh, let's say, like, the iconography page to make it easy to download or go to Figma or copy. Those little pieces that you identify are, are really cool. So there is a handful of design systems that I always look to for inspiration and the people behind them even more so. But um, I don't know if I have a favorite. It just yeah. depends on the day of the week. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. And I think that's a really good point you brought up too. Like not every company truly is right. publishing their design system publicly in this way. And right. there's also sort of two audiences really for these public design systems. There's like how a designer might look and consume it and, and use it for inspiration and learning and education. But it's also a tool for engineering if like the design system is open sourced in any way, being able to like, th- that's sort of like a resource in the engineering community as well. So I'm glad you brought that up because yeah. I hadn't like thought about that before. And I think it's important to note. <laughs> yeah. And in different pieces for different people, right? Like some designers might gravitate to one system because of perhaps like the UI or the the functional product that is coming from the design system, or even, you know, the, the company that is represented behind the design system. Like, and then for engineers, it might be something totally different. And for product managers, or those within product, it may be something totally different because of how they're able to understand how both engineering and, and design are connecting through the system. So yeah, it's uh, it's it's always cool to see what others are putting out there, what is public and what you can learn from those different systems. Yeah, ever evolving. Yeah, we'll try to add those ones that you mentioned to the show notes as well as some good inspiration. Awesome. What do you think students should be learning when it comes to design systems right now? This is a good question. And I was, I was just working with someone last week and I was on the uh, the mentoring service ADP ADP list, and they were asking this exact question. And the answer that I gave them was, as it kind of relates back to that definition of what is a design system, right? And I think the best thing that you can do is just communicating with others and learning how to communicate, and also becoming better at identifying what pieces are happening within the team you're working on, and thinking about how do I support them through a system? How do I help take maybe decisions or resources that they need and package them together, even if it's in a really lightweight way? right? One thing I learned was you don't have to build a full component library or a full design system to help someone work more efficiently or or to improve their day. If you see someone who is always like screenshotting their browser and pulling it into Figma or Sketch and overlaying a design on it, maybe that's an opportunity to create a browser mock-up UI library, right? And publish that as a component library. If you see all sorts of different buttons or colors, like maybe there's the chance to work with brand or marketing or even product to, to say like, well, which ones are we still using and which ones do we want to put forth as a practice? Like it can be these very small decisions or very small steps that lead up into something that is a library or, or a, a set of resources for more and more people in the company to use. So yeah, uh, first and foremost, I think just communication and, and just seeing who you can work with and how you can help them and then scaling that work as you continue. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, it's, it's just like noticing what people are building a lot of in like in creating resources for them to be able to not have to like continue to rebuild that thing. For whatever yeah. reason, when you were explaining that I was like even something as simple as like a presentation design although yes. presentation design it may not be simple depending on how complex you make one but like <laughs> you know if you need to if you're finding yourself or people at your company are trying to you know are, are presenting or creating a lot of presentations and uh, trying like recreating a lot of the same types of slides and you yeah. want to keep it on brand like that's another example of what could end up being a system absolutely yeah I think um I was surprised but it's my favorite part I, I was surprised at how much of working and design systems is just about observing and, and seeing what others are doing and trying to find like little holes in the process that you can fill or that you can write documentation for or that 
you can provide an avenue for communication or even provide like a, a tangible asset for someone to use. And I think it's through just like thoughtful observation and communicating that you build something that works for more and more people over time. And that is my favorite part. Okay. So I also said at the beginning of our conversation that you're also an expert educator when it comes to teaching Figma. So for, for people who are, again, new to design, kind of still learning about some of what the tools are and, and, and whatnot, a design system can exist in a software tool like Figma, but it could exist in a software tool like Sketch or Adobe XD or maybe in Google Slides like we were just talking about. But you happen to be an expert in Figma. So I wanted to talk specifically, <laughs> specifically yeah. about Figma. You definitely are, Joey. Like you're, I mean, like I said also earlier, we did some sessions together, some uh, yeah. some coaching, and it truly really did make a big difference in, in how I, I'm working at professionally at my job. So big thing. That makes today. me happy to know. Yes. yes. Yes, of course. But okay, so to kind of just, I wanted to clarify, clarify that for, for everyone listening. So we're going to switch gears, talk a little bit about Figma, design systems within Figma. And I noticed you're somewhat popular, I think, in the Figma community, especially when it comes to UI kits, user interface kits. You have quite a few resources that have a lot of usage. It looks like back when I was looking at this, you created a Mac OS monitor a UI kit with over 10,000 uh, people downloaded it. iOS 15 for the phone, over 200,000 people have used that UI kit. And then I think most recently, iOS 16, almost 100,000. And I think you even maybe have made a new one since then. So anyway, you you create yeah. these UI kits. What is a what is a UI kit? Uh, how are people using them? Like, just I'd love to hear more about that story. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for asking. Gosh, hearing those numbers, it uh, it brings back all the anxiety I had when I first published them. Um, <laughs> They're because incredible. you never expect. Yeah, you never expect that is something yeah. to be used that many times by yeah. all sorts of different people. How these get started was... I was I was finding that I was so often taking screenshots of iOS specific UI that I needed to use in work of my own and just overlaying lots of screenshots and cropped screenshots and trying to like finagle this design to make it work what I was what I was wanting to present. And I was often going from Sketch to Figma because the company I was working for at the time always used Figma and so I had to I was doing lots of importing and exporting and it was just like that felt like 10 or 15% of the design process was just gathering these like simple assets that I needed. And what started this whole thing was was actually the, the lock-in period during COVID. I, I'm totally open about this, but I was someone who was incredibly anxious at the time and was uncertain. And as mentioned, like I'm someone with diabetes and I had no idea how this, this pandemic was going to affect me. I was finding myself getting more and more into creating these little things that I needed, these little Lego pieces that would help me, where it was a way to take away some of the anxiety or to at least focus on something else let's say for for a quick bit and i started to realize like you know i'm, I'm building this larger and larger file yes it's helpful for me but i'm one designer and i wonder if it would be helpful for more people and this was back with ios 13 and uh, i decided to this was also right when the the figma community launched and so i decided to click share and just share it out and it was incredibly scary because you know you think of a resource like this and you think of the figma community being quite new i was anticipating that a, a decent number of people might might try this out and see if it worked but there felt like there was a big responsibility because i'm creating assets that people are using in designs of their own, right? Like an asset or a component that I was working on, even though it's just a recreation of, you know, the, what the wonderful team at Apple has made, it felt like, yeah, there was just that responsibility because I didn't want it to be incorrect for someone using it. I didn't want any piece of the iOS specific UI to stand out in a negative way for anyone trying to present their best work within a design review. And so I found I really enjoyed that. I loved the process of creating and tracing screenshots and trying to rebuild as much UI as I could. And looking at the iOS 16 kit, which is the most recent one, and comparing it to a few years ago for iOS 13, there's like 10 more, ten times more components inside of there. And it, the, the kit has just really like evolved since then where I've needed more UI myself. So I end up creating it. And I know others might, you know, be also be able to, uh, to take advantage of that. And so just adding more to it and then sharing it year over year has been a, um, it's been really fun. It's been something I, I never could have imagined that, gosh, 400,000 people have tried or, or f at least 400,000 tr uh, tries, I should say. Right. Um, it's been a really cool experience. Right. It's so cool. Are, could you share just a bit more about your process? Like how yeah. do you ensure that it's accurate and, or, or as accurate as possible to what is that yeah. what we are actually seeing on 
on our browsers or, or on the phone. I get it wrong all the time. There, there is so much complex UI and it's changing every, every single release that it's, it's hard for one individual to keep up, but I really enjoy it. It helps me learn more about the direction that Apple is taking with some of their platforms and how they're thinking of reusable patterns or where you're seeing some differences is always uh, pretty interesting too. My process is, is long and tedious. Uh, it's kind of like digital gardening in that way, where it's like, I'm taking lots and lots and lots of screenshots during the beta period, and I'm tracing over them, or I'm adapting previously created components to, to work for the new piece of UI that we're seeing. And it, it's fun because there there's so much that you can reuse, whether it's textiles or color or layouts, but there's also small differences that happen every single release um, that you have to account for. And so it's always funny, I'll, I'll release something in June right after WWDC, and, and a lot of people ask like, oh my gosh, how did you create this so quick? Was it like five days of work? And the answer is like the, in the latest kit, I think it combined at least over 300 hours have gone into it. And I was time tracking wow. for a while just because I was curious. And all of that time is spent adjusting and applying Figma's latest fe- features to many of these components, making sure that they're in line with what Apple, you know, finally released within within the platform and just wanting the components to be as easy to work with as possible. That way you, again, don't have to focus on them. You just focus on the design that you're creating. And so I'm going on like year four of this now and it's just, it's been super fun. It's been a really exciting thing to like look forward to. And while it does take some time, it, it helps me understand Figma better. And like I said, it helps me understand the world of mobile design better and what Apple is creating. Those are the best resources resources when it's like you're learning so much along the way yourself and then you can like give that and put it out into the world and other people can you know use it for something that they need but it's like it really came from something that you were trying to like understand first first yeah absolutely and the challenge has been how do I make something that's that's useful for myself and in my own design work but also how do I make it so that anyone else can understand like how to use this component Right. Uh, there's some complex auto layout examples there. There's some complex naming um, when it comes to component properties. And I just wanted all of that to be as easy for anyone to understand and, and to begin to work with. That way they don't have to think of it too much after they after they grab it. But yeah, I have I you know, I want to say I just I have so much respect for the team at Apple. And this uh, this project is, of course, in no way affiliated with them. But it's been amazing to see the people that inspire me, like Linda Dong and, and Mike Stern, who are on the evangelist team, the work that they do and, and just having the opportunity in Figma independently to trace over you know their work and the team's work and to try to recreate something in, in a half-hearted way or a full-hearted way but maybe halfway there I should say is is super fun and it feels like such a rewarding thing to be able to to uh to try to do even if no one were using it I think it's still something I would do each year just because the value that it brings me personally and the the joy uh is is worth it it's so great to hear so between I was 13 and I was 16 you said you were like if you feel like you're also learning about what the latest yeah. you know latest and greatest like Apple's, you know, creating for iOS. Like, can you think of like, what, what's the biggest change then that you've seen over yeah. those last few years between those two systems? Well, in Figma, a lot has changed. Right. Auto layout was just just really kind of finding its its days back in 20, 2020. And uh, we didn't have things like component properties or even variants to some extent. Wow. Actually, yeah, variants, variants didn't come out until later. So, you know, creating components that supported both themes in Figma was challenging. Creating things that didn't use component properties meant you had to have like a visual state for or a visual representation for every state of a component. So they added up pretty quickly. And then in iOS, so much has changed. If we think back to iOS 13 there, and and it's always funny, like looking back at previous screenshots, because you don't necessarily realize how much is changing with each release, whether it's like small typography details or color details, or even sizing details. Um, I found an iPad uh, actually last week, it was at my parents' house and it had iOS 8 installed on it. Oh my gosh. And oh my gosh, charging that thing and looking at what iOS 8 looks like was, yeah. you you know, you think it's so, it's only a few years back, but yeah. oh my gosh, everything was different about it. And so like identifying those details and seeing like what our experience was like compared to what it is now and how the UI has shaped everything, right? From the tools we use to how apps are designed in some way and also to how Apple is, you know, shaping the platform and preparing for future platforms is a really exciting thing. So I think everything has changed from how we build it to what the actual thing that we're building looks like. Yeah, Joey, I have my laptop from (laughs) high school. I'm not kidding. No way. And I plug it in and it works. I can turn it on and it is such a like a flash from the past yeah maybe i'll have to send you a screenshot one of these days i was thinking about making a a video on it because i also have like i 
I had Photoshop back then and I like had my like art school portfolio and, but it has like iTunes from like, I mean, like a little bit of brushed uh, metal or yeah. Oh my gosh. It's so cool. It's so cool. That's amazing. Um, You know, I think I got that laptop probably in like 2007 and I used it like for my four years of high school. So I'll have to send you some screenshots there. I'm so glad you still have it and it's working and you like take a look at it. Yes. The the old technology is uh, very durable. So anyway. Yeah. You know, that, that's interesting too, right? Because like when I, when I got into design and I feel very, well, I don't know how to feel about this, but when I got into design, this was the world of iOS seven and flat design really quickly took over. It was like all of the, the shadows and the skeuomorphism that we previously knew was, was almost out the door overnight in some regard. And buttons were, were not, you know, th- there was no more gradients. There was no more stroke. There was no more shadow. They were just like one color and it was flat. And so for, for myself as a designer who was entering the field at the time, I felt, I, it felt like just the most amazing thing because it, you had to think more about the experience rather than let's say how to create those like very detailed visuals that we had previously known. And the thing that keeps me up at night today is we're seeing some of those skeuomorphic details come back. Not in, not in the whole extent, because I think many of us know what a button is or what a control is and how it adapts to a digital UI, but we're seeing some of the, the details that were so delightful back then that probably bring a lot of that nostalgia back for you. And yeah. now figuring out like how to recreate those and tools that are much more modern like Figma or even, you know, relearning Photoshop, which has grown quite a bit since is, uh, is a pretty fun thing, but also a little intimidating if I'm being honest. Yeah, very cool. Lots to think about there yeah, yeah it's true that the schemorphic trend or sort of and schemorphic you know meaning i guess how would you describe schemorphic it's like yeah something physical think, yeah you you would probably describe it better oh sure i i for me it's always been like a an interpretation of the real world applied to digital design yes. right so yeah like the, the the app i always think of there's the compass app on ios there was the game center app which used like that uh that pool table like felt as the background i believe yeah. like, the notes app looks like a, a legal pad it, all sorts of like physical attributes that we know were recreated digitally and therefore the metaphor the metaphor was like very detailed well you know because yeah. we use metaphor a lot still in in uh product design like best practices but it was like like to your point like the felt looked like felt yes and the, yeah the buttons like looked like had all of the shine yeah. and edges and the lighting yeah. was like and it it, yeah. it was exciting because gosh you know before the iphone 4 we we never had a retina screen before and so when that iphone came out it was it felt so magical at the time because we were able to see more into our screens than ever before and the devices were able to do more for us than ever before and that that kind of like combination plus the addition of like some really incredible ui that was coming out was was just everything that inspired me to want to become a designer and want to learn from the best people out there yeah full circle for you i think yes thinking about yeah, trying <laughs> yes yeah. Okay. Can you share a little bit about Baseline? You have Baseline. Sure. Have, it's a newsletter, I know, but you also have some trainings. What is what yeah. is Baseline? Yeah, I started this. It's a little LLC that I started a few years ago, and I began it as a way to continue teaching Figma to others. I, I found I enjoy this tool so much, and we had as a collective society, we have had so much going on the last couple of years. There's way too much to worry about than how to use a design tool. And because Figma is one thing in life where I don't feel I'm too terrible at, trying to share that knowledge with others has been a lot of fun. And so I started this this company and as a part of it, I'm doing one-to-one sessions with anyone who is looking to learn more about tools like auto layout or how to use Figma from start to finish and really just wanting to become more comfortable and confident inside of the tool because it's, it's complex. There's a lot of simple things that you can do with it, but you can also make it as complex as you would like. So that's been one aspect. Also doing more and more teaching in general and working on my very first course, uh, which is coming out soon. And that's all kind of a part of it. And I'm also, as you mentioned, Alexa, like contributing to a newsletter of mine. And in that is where I go deep on various Figma features or how I'm using different tools inside of Figma that are that are coming out. So it's been a very fun thing, like keeps me accountable for, for, you know, continuing to learn the different parts of Figma. And it's just been, it's been something I didn't know that I would enjoy this much, which is just sharing and to just teaching with others and seeing those moments of like where knowledge is unlocked or where something finally clicks is amazing. I've always been someone who really aligns with kind of that one-to-one pairing versus sitting there and watching a video. And so that opportunity to be that person in some small way for another individual in design is, is incredible. I'm definitely that person. I'm like, if I'm going to go, you know, get into a, like a routine or like get fit in a certain way, like I probably need to hire a coach, <laughs> like a 
fitness coach. So it's like similar. If I'm going to like really learn a new tool or a new, you know, some, you know, yeah, a new yeah. tool or like something like I, I work best when I know like other people are involved in helping me along the way. So definitely. Yeah. Cause yeah. there's that moment where you are always going to get stuck or you, you might always second guess yourself as you continue and to have another person there, at least when I was, you know, when I think back to when I was working with other people for all sorts of things like math or calculus or physics, like all of these things that I just needed a little bit more help with being able to turn to someone in that moment and ask a question or to see another example was so powerful and, and doing that same thing within Figma for someone else is fun because like I learned from it and and they yeah. have you know you or anyone else like has something to take away whether it's an example or an experience of trying something together and seeing how something finally clicks so that's baseline it's, it's been a lot of fun it's just a little side thing but it's taught me so much about myself this year and it's really helped me understand where I want to take my career as it relates to teaching and, and helping others yes and that's so great to hear I was saying earlier like I said I took some of Joey's baseline trainings when I was trying to properly learn how to use auto layout I mean kind of a long yeah. story short which is probably a story for another time but you know had this whole career in product design. I switched into design operations for a little bit, then got back into product design. And like during that year and a half that I took that break into this other career, auto layout came out and I, you know, still at the same company I was working at, at Zendesk. And all of a sudden, like, I felt like kind of lost in my files, trying to figure out how to, you know, like apply my design work using auto layout. So I reached out to Joey and I I truly like, I'm not just saying this, like, I truly feel like I made a massive, massive difference. Oh, that's so uh, for me so I'm so glad that I found your trainings and I, I really can't awesome. recommend them enough yeah and I know we've been talking yeah. a lot about auto layout and it is a bit of a more advanced feature although if you do work at a big company or like even a medium-sized company you might that has a design systems team you might find uh, yourself interacting with auto layout uh, early in your career Joey also offers like other more like basic trainings as well for people who want to get started and I just want to one more thing on this because I do think it's really important and I was able to actually learn this from my dad early on who was also a product designer. So super lucky to have cool. uh, him yeah. in my life. Yeah. But he's, he always told me when I was first starting out how important it was to prop, learn how to properly use your tools. And you actually want to kind of think of them kind of like a musical instrument. You know, you want to be able to navigate around the tool in a way that becomes intuitive. It's like a, a part of you, like a guitar is or a, pia- a piano when you like, you've learned the language. And so I think for anyone starting out, just kind of getting those basics right, knowing how to use the quick keys and understanding yeah. why maybe like, like, a part of the tool was designed to operate in that certain way, like that's going to help you significantly later on with your career. So again, can't recommend baseline enough. Thanks, Alexa. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, You know, especially for, I love that analogy of, of uh, pairing it to, to, to instruments. And the, the, the thing that I'm seeing a lot is those who work in design systems are creating these really complex component libraries using all of the latest features because many of them make creating and maintaining these components much easier and scalable. But then for someone who isn't totally up to date on those tools, right, or has no reason to be beyond using components, it can feel really scary. And you're like, oh my gosh, I don't know how to use this button anymore. Like, how do I change the size or the width? Or why does the text go to the left now? Like all of those things are are questions that come up often. And so trying to share a little bit of like why that feature works this way, how it's applied to components, and therefore how you can use it on all of your instances in Figma um, has been a really fun thing. So I'm, I'm makes me so happy to hear that you uh, that it helped you and I appreciate yes, you saying that. Of course, of course. Have you found there to be early or designers who are early in their career interested in design system roles? Yes. Well, yeah, yeah so- absolutely. Tell me more about your experience. Yeah, talking with those those folks. And I, I was one of those people where I started in design and I wanted to get more in design systems. And what I what I hear from a lot of those who I'm mentoring is I have no idea how to get into this field because it seems like to become a design systems designer, I need to essentially have worked on a design system, but I can't do that until I am a design systems designer. And so I, I continue to stay in the, the area that I'm in, which is a bummer. And I think there's a lot to that, but I also think there's some techniques that anyone can use to share in an interview or to level up within their their own company of creating a, an internal design system there there you know as a way to create an artifact that they can use to interview with later there's so much excitement there i think the the tools have gotten just incredible as far as ways that we're able to create these libraries and maintain these design systems and for for others like seeing those who want to get into a space where they have the ability to provide and and create these assets that others on their team are using is a really special thing like i i love seeing that enthusiasm on teams and so one one question that I've gotten a lot of Alexa is like, what, how do I apply for a design systems role if I see one that's exciting, but 
I have never worked on a design system before, or I don't have one to share, or uh, what do I do, right? And it seems like that circular, you know, unfortunate reason happens. And so, what what I what I tell those who to what I tell those to do who might be looking into a design systems role or looking to make the switch is when you're in an interview, there like a very small percentage of the interview is is needed to focus on like the previous components or library that you created. And I think a much bigger portion of the interview can be spent on hearing more about you as an individual and how you communicate and how you think of these processes or these systems that you ultimately want to build out or that you have built out previously. And in, in my experience, hearing from someone who is really enthusiastic and passionate about about wanting to make a good experience for others and understanding like with the tools that are available and the people on the team and the resources that the company has, hearing from them of how they would go about it means mm-hmm. so much and can add, you know, you may even be surprised, but it can add so much more color than someone who may have worked in design systems, but doesn't explain how they go about it or how they would go about uh, mm-hmm. things. And so that's like, that's my biggest piece of advice is just share about you and how you think and how you are, again, as we've talked about this podcast, like you're building for the people next to you. And so how would you frame that in an interview and how as a product designer or someone entering the field, how have you designed for those next to you and how would you apply that same knowledge to design systems? Because it's all very similar. Your user is just shifting. I guess, yeah, I mean, that sounds like such sound advice, I think, especially for once you do have that interview. But would you say that like in order to actually land that initial conversation you still need to be able to demonstrate in a, in your portfolio that you have that relevant experience or like what does that look like I think so and I think there are ways to do this without creating a fully fledged design system if you were to even publish something internally or on Figma or, or something to share of like hey I wanted to recreate this component and here's how I did it in Figma here's how I named my layers here's how mm. I created the component properties here's how I applied auto layout and finally here's how I was making sure that it worked for the use case which I was imagining, right? Whether it's on iOS or Android or web, like all of these different platforms, just sharing an example of how you would go about organizing and and keeping things consistent and and detailed is really important. And and that, again, can be like a very small portion of the interview. But I do think there's value there into showing someone else how you organize and how you structure things. Because that's such a big part of the job. And that demonstrates the care and craft and detail-oriented, detail-orientedness, detail-focused like approach that you're taking because you are anticipating someone else having to use your work to create their best work, right? And so Mm -hmm. putting emphasis on that is really important. A lot of portfolio review is how you tell the story of the thing that you built. And so it's just, yeah, reframing it, I guess, to to tell that story of that very specific detailed design system, that component, and focusing on that versus filling your portfolio with the, the projects that someone who's not in a design systems role and maybe like trying to um, build out a specific product feature. Definitely. And there's, there's still value there. Like if you are someone who has worked in product design previously and you're wanting to enter the design systems world, do it. We need more amazing people, but don't, uh, please don't discount that work because there's a lot of value there in showing how you think and how you organized and how you were thinking of the end user. And all of that same knowledge can be applied back to design systems because, you know, as mentioned, there's still a user, there's still, still someone using your work. It's just, shifted who that person is. And I think all of those same principles and who you are as a person and who you are as a designer still apply. And that's a good point too. Do you remember back to your first interview that you did for a design systems role? Like what did your portfolio look like? Oh my gosh, I had none. I was, this is, and this is where this advice comes from is because I was, I, I had more knowledge into the world of design systems. And what I had was I was working at Figma at the time. Um, I was working as a designer advocate. And as a part of that role, I was really fortunate to get to meet lots of teams out there and to see how they were building these design systems and how are they they were communicating with with teams that they were working with and adjacent to and so my my interview for when i when i applied at twitter a small company has been in the news recently made a first <laughs> Uh, <laughs> when I applied at Twitter was it was all about focusing on the the things I was learning and how I was hoping to apply those learnings through the work I was it was it was a hard one but I was also using the iOS kit to demonstrate like that first example of here's how I make something and here's how I think of the tools that are available in Figma and so that was a really challenging interview because I had to balance the best of like previous product design work paired with like lots of knowledge uh, over time and, and trying to capture that knowledge and present it in a way that that was able to be shared with others and also trying to package up a side project and i i'm really hesitant to ever mention like side projects for interviews because we all have
have so much going on and there's only so much time and energy. And I, I do just want to say, like, if you are enjoying it as I was, like, go about it. You know, whatever helps relieve the anxiety or makes you happy, I think is really valuable. But please don't feel like you have to go out there and create the next iOS kit or Android kit or whatever it might be because you're trying to get a job. Like that is definitely not the case. It, I think there are small bits from those or those previous side projects that you can use to to illustrate your work and to highlight how you um, how you think and how you exist as a designer. Joey, thank you so much. I'm feeling so inspired after this conversation. I love talking. <laughs> Me too, Alexa. Yeah. Good, good. I love talking about design systems and Figma and, and all the things. Is there anything else that's top of mind before we wrap up that you wanted to bring up? Thanks for having me. It's it's just, uh, the, I guess the final thing I'll say is like, when I was first breaking into design systems, I was always, I was so nervous of how to get into this field because there are only a small number of people within every company working on design systems. But as much as you can for anyone out there looking to apply, we need really incredible, passionate people in this field and like ever changing. The tools are changing, the landscape is changing. And I think we're even seeing more internal design design systems pop up. And so the roles are still coming. And if I can ever help out through mentoring or through, you know, anything Figma related, please reach out, but don't give up there. There are an endless number of companies and therefore an endless number of design system roles that are coming. Excellent. And Joey, uh, where can people find you online if they want to connect with you? Yeah. Yeah. You know, with the current landscape, I'm hesitant to give out in social media, but I uh, I am on my newsletter quite a bit, which is uh, which is at joey joeyabanks.substack.com. I write there a lot about Figma and design systems, and uh, I am on Twitter and and also on Post, which is a new social network from Read.cv, which I've really been enjoying. And so a few places. Excellent, excellent. Those will all be in the yeah. show notes below. Again, awesome. thank you so much. It was so great chatting with you. Uh, I thanks, feel like Alexa. I learned so much every time. So thank you. Ah, same here. I really appreciate being on and thanks for all the thoughtful questions. Of course. We'll talk very soon. All right. Bye. All right. Bye. A big thanks to Joey again for sharing all of his knowledge with us about design systems and how to start thinking about them as a beginner to design. If this conversation has got you super excited about taking that next big step with your career in design systems or otherwise, then listen up. Springboard offers a nine month UI UX design bootcamp with one on one mentorship, real world design projects, and personalized career coaching. And it comes with a job guarantee. Use the code Adaptive by Design to get $1,000 off enrollment for design bootcamps with Springboard. You can find more information in the description below. Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure to subscribe to stay up to date as new episodes drop. Again, my name is Alexa and you've been listening to Adaptive by Design, living the UX life. I'll see you next time.